Acts chapter 4. We're looking again at verse 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, the scene, again, is simple. Uh, miracle has taken place. Lame beggar has been raised to his feet after over 40 years of age, being that way, begging at the gate beautiful. Peter's been involved, instrument of Jesus to get it done. The guy's on his feet now. They've gone to Solomon's porch. Great crowd has gathered. Peter's preaching. The leaders of Israel upset, interrupt grab Peter, John, take them down, put them in jail for the night. The next day, news is spread. They've invited all the hierarchy. Other people besides the, just the normal members of the Sanhedrin have gathered. We've gone through that in verse 5 and 6. The elders are there. Uh, Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and many of those uh, who were of the high priest's family were gathered together. So they had a special meeting. Peter and John are placed in the middle of this uh, to give an account. And, of course, the question is asked, no chit-chat, no beating around the bush. It's just by what power or by what name have you done this? And then it gives this clear-cut explanation. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And then the answer comes. And there's a strong emphasis on filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I believe that something has been going on this week. I'm not sure what. I'm not talking about circumstances. Uh, the circumstances have been chaotic. But then they were chaotic last week too. <laughs> so it isn't circumstances. Hey, circumstances are circumstances. Come on. Life is in turmoil for all of us. So that isn't a big deal. That's a given. So that isn't changing uh, the impact of this morning. Circumstances. So this is not a circumstantial thing. Maybe I'm just not prepared. Well, that's probably always true, but then I've prepared as much for this morning as I always prepare. Maybe I don't have an outline. Well, I do have an outline. Got the same, you know, words all starting alike. You know, I got all that. Um, but I believe God is wanting to do something. Um, is building to something. Uh, I didn't realize it, but Shane said to me this morning that this was our sixth year anniversary for the church. We started six years ago, September, beginning of September. Men in a little strip mall down here uh, and began with the vision of church and school of practical ministry. But that can't be it either because I didn't even, that never dawned on me until he said that this morning. Uh, there is a, uh, see, if you come to the book of Acts, and in every Bible you read, the book is called the Acts of the Apostles, which is totally wrong. I mean, that is not inspired by God put in there. I mean, we put that in there. Nod your heads. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> yeah, we put that in there. Because it's not really the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And everywhere you go through the book, the Holy Spirit is moving through these guys that you look at and say, good night, who are they? So the whole emphasis is on the divine movement of God through the human life. And I've wanted to say to you a lot of times, but uh, never did. Man, I wish I could, I, I wish you could, I wish you could know what I know. And the reason I haven't said that is because that sounds so arrogant. <laughs> like I know something special and you don't. I'm above you. And that's not it. It's just like a guy has sat down at the table and just ate this phenomenal meal. And I want to turn to you and say, hey, there's a chair right here for you. <laughs> Come and eat too. Because I don't have anything you, you can't. See, this is not, this is, whoa, we're all, and God wants to do something everything he's done in my life and more and I feel like a kindergarten in the thing I feel like I've just I just uh, where's the sandbox <laughs> you know that's what I feel like in this whole spiritual realm of what God is doing 
But what I found out is so phenomenal and what I'm experiencing in him is so great. And, and I know the turmoil and I know the crisis and I know the circumstances of life and that are pressing upon us and everyone have our own, we all have our own story. But, but I'm telling you, there's something that God wants to do in your life that he has provided not just for a few, not just for a, a, a select group, not just for super spiritual superior lot, but for you. He wants you in on this. And somehow I, I just cry inside if I, could just, if I could just tell you, if I could just give to you, if, I could, if you could just... Because it's all, it's all available in him. And I, I talked to Jesus about this, and he told me he loves you more than he loves me. And I can understand that. So if he's given this to me, what, what could he do for you? What would he do for you? Where, where could he take you? What could he do in your life? And when you, when you come to this passage, and you stand up and you talk about filled with the Holy Spirit, in a normal crowd, you're going to have about half that crowd go, ooh. Because the filled with the Holy Spirit has gotten such a bad rap. And we in the holiness movement haven't helped it a lot. And the charismatics haven't helped it a lot. And the Pentecostals haven't helped it a lot. And maybe the Baptists have ignored it, I don't know. But anyhow, the whole thing is just something. We, we, we haven't treated this thing right, folks. Uh, and what's really going on, one of the things I want to try to tell you uh, and share with you today is that one of the things that's going on in this whole idea of filled with the Spirit is that it, there's, a, there's a, well, we'll start with this, a, a paternal influence. In other words, something is being birthed in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. That is, now help me with this, concentrate on this, walk through this with me. See, we have indicated that the fullness of the Spirit was like an addition to. See, there's this normal Christianity thing, and then there's this addition to. Now, most people are just normal Christianity. But there's a few far out people that really get a bit weird, but hey, you got to have them because I don't know why, but you got to have them. So here they are, and, and they're, 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 they're this filled with the Spirit, and they do these things in the fullness of the Spirit that normal Christians just aren't interested in. But that's not the case. You've got to get that clear out of your brain. See, here's the computer, and there's the normal people on the normal computer. We can poke the buttons. We can, hey, and oh, why didn't that work? We can do that kind of. Then there's the geek guy. <laughs> See, the spirit-filled guy is the geek guy, and we're just the normal. I'm not interested in learning all that computer junk, man. I, I don't want to even bother my mind. I need the geek guy. So that when I got a, and when I have a, oops, hey, geek guy, come and help me. So I need that guy to help. It, and we do that in the spiritual realm. Here's the geek guy who's filled with the spirit. And I'm in normal life. And whoops, got a flat tire. Hey, geek guy, you got a patch. But I'm trying to share with you that that whole thought process, and, and we fostered that. Hey, and I'm not undermining my theology or our theology that we, we even teach here, but and whatever theology you've come from, but there's this, I've been saved, and now I'm going to be filled with the Spirit like they were two separate, like this was apples and this was oranges. And if you never get to this, it's okay, as long as you got this, because you're going to heaven. But I'm telling you, the phrase here, whatever, whatever you want to do with all of that I just said, the phrase here is not about the geek guy. The phrase here is about the everyday, normal, walking with Jesus kind of stuff. And what the Spirit of God is doing in the book of Acts, He is birthing 
a whole new dynamic of Christianity. There is the old covenant and there is the new covenant. And this is the birthing of the new covenant. And everybody who's in the kingdom will be birthed into this, which is the fullness of the Spirit. And the fullness of the Spirit is not a weird, not a far out, not a ooh. And we've even fostered that kind of idea that, you know, when you got saved, Jesus saved you. Thank you, Jesus. But then I went on to college and got the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was kind of subnormal. He was kind of kindergarten, sandbox level. But the Holy Spirit is college level. And I've gone beyond that. So I've given up Jesus to move into the Spirit. That's not true, folks. Are you getting this? See, that's back to the geek stuff. Everybody who's Christian is filled with the Spirit. You cannot be Christian without being filled with the Spirit. It's the nature of who we are. It's the dynamic of our structure. It's the very essence. And who is the Spirit? He is the Spirit of Jesus. And his sole purpose, Jesus said, was to reveal who Jesus is. So the interesting thing about it is, the guy who's filled full of the Spirit ends up doing what? Talking about Jesus, which is exactly what Peter did in this passage. He had nothing to say about the Spirit at all in this discourse to the, to the Sanhedrin. He only talked to them about Jesus and more of Jesus and more of Jesus and more of Jesus. Why? Because he's filled with the Spirit of Jesus, who is constantly revealing Jesus. So this is not an off the wall, this is not a if you want you can, this is not will be nice for some but not for me, this is not well I'm normal computer but the geek guy, this, see that whole picture has got to be pushed out of your mind and you've got to understand that what is happening in the book of Acts is there is a launching of a birthing of a whole new intimate relationship with God whereby you and him literally get together in such an intimacy that you and him flow in a merging and he literally begins to take you to a new level of living. And that is for every single person who's going to be kingdom person. So if you say Christian, we expect this of you. If you say, I'm a Christian, we expect you to be this. This is what we visualize. This is what we see. That you are intimate. You have the very Spirit of God indwelling you. That you are filled with the Spirit. That you're literally walking in His power. That you're sourced by His being. That He literally is living His life through you. See, that's what we visualize. Because that's what's being birthed in this passage. And I'm sure I've walked you through before the idea that, of course, cultures are different. Uh, and we all have our way of thinking, and it's neither right or wrong or good or bad. Uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, you go down to Florida, and it's 50 degrees. And, man, they're freezing to death. You go to North Dakota, and it's 50 degrees, and, whoa, it's T-shirt weather. Which is not right, wrong, good, bad, they are, they aren't. Hey, it's not that kind of a deal. It's just culture. Come on. That's culture stuff. So when you go to the Jews, they had a culture. We have a culture. And our culture, of course, divides things up. And it's partly due to our information generation and all the knowledge that we have. Because we can't... See, when I started out, I read every Christian book that came out. Every one. Never missed. I read every one. Why? There weren't that many. <laughs> About 10 years ago, I quit. Absolutely quit. Why? Because you can't keep up. You just... So things have changed. And, and in our culture, we divide things up. See, we don't go to a doctor. We go to an eye doctor. We go to a, we go to a nose throat specialist. We go to a heart doctor. We go to... See, we... Not a doctor. You don't... See, we specialize. We, we divide things up. They didn't do that in their culture. See, they thought in terms of wholeness, the big picture, the totality. See, I look at the tree, they looked at the forest. Now, that's not a right or wrong, I got that. 
So when they came to the life of Jesus, what they, what they, what they saw when they saw Jesus was, whoa. I see. They saw. For instance, I see. Oh, he died for me. Thank you, Jesus. And I spent hours and hours and hours preaching on his death. Amen. And isn't that significant? Yes. But folks, Jesus didn't die for you and then wipe his hands and say, hey, I died for you so you could be forgiven of your sins. And that's really all I wanted to get done. So, hey, have a happy forgiveness. That isn't it. He died and rose from the dead. As if those are one deal. Not two deals, one deal. And when he rose from the dead, he didn't wipe his hands and say, hey, I just died for you so you could be forgiven, and I just rose from the dead so you could be forgiven forever. Have a happy forever. Woo! He didn't do that. He died, rose from the dead, and ascended to the right hand of the Father to sit at the right hand of the Father as King of kings and Lord of lords to boss you around forever. (laughs) And he didn't just wipe his hands and say, hey, that's all I wanted to do, forgive you so you'd be forgiven. Hey, raised from the dead so you'd be forgiven forever and then reign over you so I could boss you around forever. Although he probably will do that. But that's not what he was after. See, he didn't just wipe his hands and say, that's all I wanted. He died, rose from the dead, ascended to the right hand of the Father and poured out the essence of his nature into you and said, whoa, that's what I wanted. That's what this was all about. This was not about, I forgive you. Oops, did it again. I forgive you. Oops, did it again. I forgive you. Oops, did it again. See, it's not about that. This is way be. this is not, well, I'll go to heaven when I die. This is not about that. What is this whole thing about? It's about God wants to come and live within you. He wants to fill you with his spirit. The essence of the nature of God indwelt within your flesh. And folks, if you miss that, you've missed it all. And they saw that as one big event. And they called that salvation. Does does that make any sense to you? So this fullness of the Spirit is not some tagged on geek thing. This business of the fullness of the Spirit It's the very essence of the life of God indwelt within the Christian that makes you who you are. And it is the it is the spring. It is the it is the how do we want to say it? The result. It's the flow. It's the it's the purpose. It's the dynamic of the fullness of the spirit of the death of Jesus in you. This is what he wanted to get done. So I'm trying to tell you in this passage and in the book of Acts, he's birthing. This whole new deal. Now, there's a prophecy influence as well as you get into this. This fullness filled with the Spirit of Holy Spirit is the, is the, how can I tell you this? Is the climax and the fulfillment of all the prophecies. In other words, everywhere you go in the Old Testament, there's prophecies. And it's interesting that when when Peter stands up to preach and give explanation, he immediately goes to the Old Testament and quotes these prophecies. So this idea of the new covenant and of God actually indwelling the human life and you and him being together in intimacy and flowing with him, that literally is a prophetic, I mean, as if, and the significance of that is God has been planning on this For a long time. In fact, the first sin, man is out. God comes along, kills an animal, slaughters the blood, uh, slaughters the animal, spills the blood, and and the redemption program is birthed in in its symbolism, at least, and in the mind and the heart of God. That there is a prophecy of I'm going to restore you back to what Adam was. And what was Adam? A man filled with the Spirit of God. So all God is doing is getting us back to
too. And he's been talking about this. So all the Old Testament talks about this. Every chapter speaks of this. Everywhere you go, it, we're looking towards this. The, the dream of the, pro, the, of the prophets was this. And, and when the writer of the Hebrews says, oh, they had no idea what they were looking at. They just went by faith and said, whoo. But they never received the promise. This is the promise. So what I'm trying to tell you is this has been the Holy Spirit, what's happening in the fullness of the Spirit is a new thing is being birthed, parental influence, and there's this prophetic influence of, whoa, and do you understand we live, don't talk to me about the second coming, we live, don't talk to me about the rapture, we live in the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament right now in the fullness of the Spirit. One of the prophecies that Peter gave in his first message over in Acts chapter 2 was, uh, he quoted right out of Joel chapter 2. And the prophecy was, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit. And the interesting thing about the biblical view is, last days, the last days is a phrase bespeaking a, in a time when God was wrapping the whole thing up and it would be, it's all over. And he says, and the scripture says, and the belief was by the early church that the last days begins, and the Old Testament says this, begins with the first, the first coming, the birth of Jesus. So if you say, are we in the last days? I always say, yes! And you know when they started? When Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. That's biblical. So we've been in, the, been in the last days a long time. Now, I don't like that. I understand. If the last days wants to last six months, that's okay. But hey, let's get on with it. But the last days has been around a long time. Because Jesus, see, they, they saw, biblically, the Bible sees the birth of Jesus and the coming of Jesus and the fullness of the Spirit in that time bracket as a flow of all they, that wants to be accomplished in prophecy. So we're living in that. You're living in the last days. And get to experience the fullness of the Spirit of God within you. That's phenomenal. Uh, of course, there's also about this, not only the parental influence, the prophetic influence, but the portrait influence. Because the whole big deal about the Holy Spirit coming to live within you, which you get out of this passage, in the fullness of the Spirit, is that the face of Jesus is going to be seen. What is it that we really want out of you? Well, we don't want anybody to take drugs. But folks... If we got that done, it wouldn't solve a thing. Do you understand that? Well, we don't want anybody to, uh, we don't want any alcoholics, so nobody can drink anymore. If we got that done, well, we don't want any more pornography. Well, if we got that done and all pornography was eliminated, it would change the thing. No more abortions! Wouldn't change a thing. Why? Because that's not what we're after. That's why we're not marching downtown with signs. Don't drink. Well, because don't drinking, no drinking is not the issue. That's not our cause. That is a symptom. Well, what are you after? Everybody to be like Jesus. Well, how is Jesus? Well, the New Testament is full of it. But how is Jesus is all answered in, filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit of God in the man called Jesus produced a life that was the image of the Father. That's what we're after. 
for you to be filled with the same spirit that indwelt Jesus so that the same image of the Father will be produced through you that was produced through him. Well, what's the rules on that? There are none. Well, how do I get that done? You can't. Well, how am I going to pull that off? You won't. This is a filled with the Spirit, which is not a geek thing. It's an everybody sit down at the table, eat. We're all here. Kind of deal. So every individual, see, I'm trying to tell you that this whole deal is he's birthing a whole new covenant And in this new covenant, there's going to be an intimacy with the person of God. And that intimacy is going to be so powerful and so overwhelming in everybody's life that it literally is going to bring us and fulfill all the prophecies of the Old Testament. And it's literally going to produce through your life the image of God. And when Peter got done preaching, they looked at each other, and uh, you see it in verse 13, and it just, we just refer to it all the time. At the end of verse 13, and they realized they'd been with Jesus. These guys act just like Jesus. What on earth? We kill one, and it doesn't, and it doesn't show up. Wouldn't you like to have been there at Pentecost? Man, I'm not with the disciples. I'm talking about out on the street. And suddenly, these, these Pharisees are standing over there wiping their hands, saying, Got rid of one Jesus. Hey, that's, he's dead and gone. Some rumors of his resurrection, but hey, one dead Jesus. Whew, glad he's gone. Don't have to mess with that anymore. And all of a sudden, wham, the Holy Spirit hits that place, and 3,000 run up out of the building. 3,000 of them. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to see their faces? Whoa! <laughs> Kill all 3,000 of them! And they did try to do that. And the next thing you know, you got 5,000 added to it. And the next thing, well, there's, there's, there's small applying. Get, stop! this and they reached out to grab them and they scattered like rats and went all over the whole world and in 70 years the whole world became Christian which is what we're about so we're not campaigning against we are campaigning for oh you got to sit down at the table and eat and be filled with and have in your life And be intimate with. That out of you might flow this picture of the life of Jesus. Would you let him do in you what he did in Jesus? Would you you literally turn him loose to do in you what he did in Jesus? That the Father might be seen. Now, in this fullness of the Spirit... And to get a hold of what I've been talking about, you have to look at the idea, you have to look at Peter. And I want to spend a little time on that. Then Peter filled with the Spirit. So we're not talking about, we're not talking about a superior person. We're not talking about uh, a member of the Sanhedrin who's had PhDs in uh, spiritual mysticism. We're not talking about one who's gone through the schools and trained. See, we're talking about Peter. You know, Peter. He's uncouth. He smells at times. If you want to be in a fist fight, he's the guy to have. If you want to, uh, see, he's the, he's, it's Peter. He is filled. Don't you think it's interesting? That he's the star in the picture. That the Spirit of God is using that guy. And we would all look at him and say, nah, isn't going to happen. But he used that guy. And the interesting thing about it is that in in the grammar and in the structure of what's being said there, then Peter, filled with the Spirit, he is emphasizing this idea of a state of existence. And that's another part of this concept I want you to get. That the Spirit of God is ushering us into a whole new covenant. And that new covenant is an intimate relationship with God in a way that we've never had before. And it's not a series of activities. It's not a new ceremonies to do. It's an intimacy of relationship with. And in that intimate relationship, 
all the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled because this is really one big deal and it's not a geek thing. It's, a, it's an every Christian thing. It's the DNA of who we are filled with the Spirit. And out of that is going to come this picture of the person of Jesus. He's, our face is going to become, we're going to begin to look like the Father and be the image of the invisible God in our world. And when you look at Peter, that was produced in him. And it was a state that was consistent and constant. In other words, in the passage, the idea is not Peter walks into this crisis moment and the Holy Spirit anoints him and whoa, he comes through. Oh, good. And then it goes away. Until the next crisis. And then in the next crisis, the Holy Spirit hits the boy again. Whoa! And he comes through. And then it goes away. That's not what you're dealing with. What you're dealing with in the passage is, and it's very clear, he walks into this scene filled with the Spirit. And in the scene itself, he's filled with the Spirit. And the reason the Spirit is operating in this crisis moment in his life is because he came into this crisis filled with the Spirit. And nothing is happening here that didn't happen yesterday and the day before and the day before. When he was snoring at night, this was happening. This is who the boy is in God. And this is a state of existence in which he dwells. That's really important, I think. Because again, often in this whole setup of our theology, I've gotten the feeling that we wanted some kind of special, special deal to fall upon us at a special moment to who When what we really need is the consistency of the indwelt presence of God in the human life that consistently makes you like you ought to be. And that this is not an in and an out thing, not a come and a go kind of thing. This is the continual presence of an almighty God who's living in you. And you dwell in this state of existence. That would change everything. Because then you wouldn't come to church to get, oh. You would come to church to give. Oh. Did you get that? See, you wouldn't come to church to receive. You'd come to church to spill out. Why? Because you live in this state. This state of existence where... He is indwelling you and you are intimate with him and you go to bed with him and you get up with him and you eat with him and, and all the life is filled with him and, every, and then when you walk into a crisis, guess what? He's there! And do you realize the chaos of, of not having that? Because if you, if you don't have him and he doesn't live within you and you step into a crisis, then you're scrambling to, oh, I need help, God, where are you? Oh, And I'm not after spatial anointings. I'm after consistency of presence. I don't, I don't, I don't want to sing anymore. All reverence and God bless Bill Gaither. But I don't want to sing, he touched me anymore. <laughs> See, I don't want to touch. I'm not interested in a touch. I'm not interested. Jesus passed by. I'm not interested in Jesus passing by. See, I, I want an indwelling. I want a consistency. I want a relationship with God whereby He penetrates the pores of my flesh and I move into a new covenant and He indwells me and in a state of existence, I live day after day after day after day and wherever you see me, you are going to see a man who is filled with the Spirit. Whether it's a crisis moment or whether it's lounging or whether it's hanging out or whether it's... Because it's a consistent state. Now, that should make sense to us because, see, that's the makeup of the kingdom person. And, and we've gone over this and over this. Hey, I am not the kingdom. Jesus isn't the kingdom. But when the two of us get together, we make up the kingdom. The kingdom is not a location to go to. It's not a place to live in. 
a geographic location. It's not heaven. There is a place called heaven, but that's not what we're talking about when they talk about the kingdom. In kingdom, we're talking about relationship. And the relationship is, oh, this who he is and who I am coming together. And in that, we become the kingdom. So if I'm going to be a kingdom person, this is going to be the DNA of my structure. Uh, Go to your house and magically pull out all the studs and put them in the yard. Well, well, the whole thing is going to collapse. Why? Because the house is not, this is a stupid illustration. The house is not, I mean, it's all there. The roof is there, but it's not in the right place. The floor is there, but it's being covered by something that shouldn't. And the whole thing is a messed up. Why? Because you can't, the studs have to, the two before has got to, I mean, it's just, see, if you want to pull this fullness of the Spirit out and say, oh, I'll be Christian without this, you can't. It's a part of the DNA and structure of what makes you who you are. So you can't talk about being Christian without talking about this intimacy. You can't talk about being Christian without this all this oneness of God in your heart. And I'm, I, you can't talk about being a Christian without being merged with the very essence of his life. This, this, is, this is the description. And guess what? This is not a temporary get me over the hump. Down here, I need the fullness of the Spirit. Why? Lots of problems, lots of needs. Oh, he, I can't make it, I can't live it. What? But when I get to heaven, I won't need... What? It isn't about I need to get over. It's about the makeup of who you are. Kingdom people are people filled with the Spirit, and that's never going to go away. So in heaven, you're going to be filled with the Spirit, or you won't be there. Why? Because the people who aren't filled with the Spirit aren't there. So this is the very structure of Christianity. Otherwise, the tuba floors are in the yard and your house is not your house. You guys are great. So what are we saying? We're saying filled with the Spirit is not a geek thing. I'm just a normal No, filled with the Spirit isn't the normal. It's a thing that's been birthed by Jesus. Death, resurrection, ascension, outpouring, and this thing was birthed. And that's a new covenant. That's a new covenant. And the new covenant is an intimate relationship whereby you are literally filled with with his being. And all of the Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled in this fullness and in this intimacy and in this oneness. And it produces the the literal image of the Father and you begin to look like God, act like Jesus. Because he was the visible image of the invisible Father and had this same structure. And it's a state of existence which is consistent, constant, and if you are going to move into a crisis, you'd better have this state of existence before you get there. Otherwise, you're going to be scrambling. Because this doesn't come and go. This isn't here and then it's there. This is a consistent makeup of the kingdom person and who you are. This is your life. Oh, Jesus. Give me such a state of your presence, your indwelling, your life. And Lord, uh, in the midst of the confusion of our theological world and in the variety of backgrounds and in the various theologies that we have argued over, that are even probably represented in this place. We ask that somehow you would help us to go beyond those theological ingrainings and you would help us to see you. Oh, Spirit of Jesus. Jesus. 
We're not seeking anointing. We're not seeking a special touch. We're not coming today, God, because we've got a little problem or a big problem. And we're asking you to intervene and be involved in our lives. We want a state of existence whereby you indwell us with the fullness of your spirit. And because you indwell us, we are kingdom people. And as in kingdom people, we live in you. And you live in us. And you are the very two before studs of our life that shape us and cause us to have our, our being and make us who we are. And in dwelling in you day after day after day, crisis are no problem because you can stand us in front of a, a, a Sanhedrin and we don't have to scramble to get your presence on the scene because we've been dwelling in you. We've been living in you. We've been practicing your presence. We've been relying on you. We've been saturating in your being. It is our lifestyle. It is who we are as kingdom people. And we know you. I crave, oh God, in the name of Jesus, for everyone in the sound of my voice to know the wonder of intimacy with you. They can know what it is to walk with you. They can know what it is to have their arm, your arm wrapped around them. Better than that, if they could know what it is to have the very touch and movement of your presence consistently and constantly in their inner lives. If they could know what it is to experience the emotions of God and to begin to learn the mind of the Father and give expression to the attitude of God. Heads are bowed. Anyone here want to say this morning, I'm not satisfied with my present state of filled with the Spirit. I don't know Him well enough. I'm not intimate, intimate enough with Him. I've had touches from Him. There have been times I've been in His presence. There have been wonderful moments when He intervened in my life. But the dwelling, the living in, the day in and day out, I find myself in crisis, scrambling. When I should have walked into them in confidence, because I came into it filled with the Spirit. Anybody here want to give expression? To say, Jesus, do in me what you need to do. To bring me into the fullness of the prophecies of the Old Testament. The birthing of a new covenant in my life. Bringing me into a state of dwelling that is beyond the religion of our hour. Our altar is open for you. For those who have a cry in their heart. Say, this has got to go beyond. Spirit of God, fill me. I don't want to be a geek. I want to be a normal saint of God, walking in the power of the Spirit. And every moment of my life, Be obedient.